Well, please open your Bible at John's Gospel and chapter 14. We come together to some of the best known and best words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And they are words that I believe all of us today very much need to hear. John chapter 14, verse 1, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. My prayer for us all in the services at the Orchard this weekend is that you will feel that you are able, as it were, to pull up a chair and to sit down with these words of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you'll be able to let them soak into your mind and into your heart so that your faith may be nourished and that any wounds that are being carried will, by God's grace, be wonderfully healed. Now, the context of these best-known and most-loved words of Jesus was the context of broken trust. This was the night of the Last Supper. Jesus had gathered with His disciples, and it was a di dinner in which everything seemed to go wrong. An argument had blown up among the disciples about which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Am I getting the respect that I deserve? And all the tension that goes with that. Where people sat in a formal occasion like the Passover in the time of Jesus was quite a big deal. And I suspect that the argument over who was to be regarded as the greatest blew up as they sort of jockeyed for position as to who was to sit where at this last supper with Jesus, and all the tension is there in the air. And many of you know well the story of how Jesus got up on that evening, and He put a towel around His waist, and He took a basin, and He went round the room and he washed the feet of all of his disciples. John chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God, he rose from the supper, he laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. Here then is the person who is seated in the highest position of honor. And he leaves that position. He gets up, and he goes, and he washes the feet of the disciples. This is the story of Jesus represented almost in a dramatic form right here in that room in the Last Supper. Here's the Son of God, and where is He? He's in the position of highest honor. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's in the position of supreme honor and glory. What did He do? He laid it aside. He humbled Himself. He took the very form of a servant. He's born in human likeness. Why did He do this? He did this to minister to us. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. Jesus did not come to lay a list of demands on you. Jesus Christ did not come to take things from you. Jesus Christ came to serve, and Jesus Christ came to give, and He came to bring eternal and infinite good to you. And when in this beautiful act Jesus had completed washing the feet of the disciples, if you look in chapter 13 and verse 12, it says there very significantly that when He had washed the disciples' feet, He put back on His outer garments, and notice what it says, He resumed His place. In other words, right here we have a pictorial, dramatic representation of the whole story of Jesus. He leaves the position of honor. He takes the form of the servant. He humbles himself even to the point of death. But God highly exalts him. Jesus resumes his place at the right hand of the Father in heaven. The Father bestows on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. And then as we follow the story of that evening, 
after Jesus had washed the feet of the disciples, chapter 13 and verse 21, John tells us that Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And Matthew and Mark both record that one by one around the room, the disciples began to ask this question, Lord, is it I? Is it I? They all felt that they had it in them to let the Lord Jesus Christ down. Very significantly, none of them said, is it Judas? You see, when Judas abandoned the faith that he had once professed in Jesus, no one would have guessed that he would have done such a thing. No one apart from Jesus saw that one coming. Friends, it is always devastating when a known and trusted leader denies the faith he once proclaimed. And that is exactly what the disciples were dealing with at the Last Supper. They didn't know who it was at this time, but they did know because Jesus told them that one of their own number, one of the trusted leaders, one of the apostles themselves would betray Jesus. And if someone that you have trusted, someone you have respected, abandons the faith that they once professed, you will know how devastating that can be. Here is someone I loved. Here is someone I looked up to. Here is someone I trusted. Here is someone I respected. If I cannot trust him, who in the world can I trust? And if someone who seemed to you to be so strong in faith can walk away from Jesus, how do you know, 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 know that the same thing will not at some point happen to you? So, this, this was a night where everything seemed to be going wrong. And there was more. Jesus announced his own departure, verse 33 of chapter 13, little children, yet a little while, and uh, I am with you, and where I am going, you cannot come. And Peter says, verse 36, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus says, where I am going, you cannot follow. But Peter insists Verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you? I will lay down my life for you. Very significant words. Peter to Jesus, I will lay my life down for you. Now, that's heroic. Peter's saying, Jesus, nothing will ever stop me from following you. Someone else in this room may betray you, but me, never. I will lay down my life for you. Isn't it interesting that Peter is the hero in his own story? Isn't it amazing how often we become the hero in our own stories, the way that we see ourselves and how we are so much better than everyone else? He believes in himself. He really does. I'm no quitter. I'm no fake. I'm the real deal. And whatever, it come, whatever cost comes to me in the course of following you, Jesus, count on me. I can rise to it. That's what he's saying. Sometimes the failures of others can bring out the ugliest self-righteousness. Do you know that? And that's what's happening here with Peter. Well, someone else is going to let the side down, not me. A Christian leader falls into sin, and in your heart rises the spirit of the Pharisee who Jesus spoke about in his story in Luke in chapter 18, who went into the temple supposedly to pray and said, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. 
That's where Peter was. But notice what Jesus says to him, verse 38, will you lay down your life for me? Really? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. And most of you know the story very well that a few hours later, Jesus was arrested, and when a servant girl suggested to Peter that he was indeed one of the followers of Jesus, Peter three times denied that he had ever known the Lord, and when he heard the rooster, he went out and wept bitterly. What are you to do when your trust is broken? What are you to do when someone you trusted, someone you respected, turns out to be very different from the person you thought they were? And then, what are you to do when you discover that despite all your own best intentions, your own flesh fails you, and you cannot even trust yourself? Well, that is where we need these wonderful, well-known, but perhaps not often well-applied words of Jesus in John and chapter 14. And I want you to see against that background that we've just tried to sketch here the significance of what Jesus says in telling us first that there is a Savior that you can trust. When your trust has been broken, when you have found that you cannot even trust in yourself, there is a Savior you can trust. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Now, you see, when you discover the hidden sins of others, and when you discover the sins that are hidden in your own heart, the greatest danger is that you end up worrying your way into unbelief. And Jesus says, don't do that. Don't go down that road. Here's what you must do instead. You must believe in God. Believe also, He says, in me. Do you notice that in the 14 verses that were read today, that the word believe comes no less than six times? Verse 1, believe in God. Verse 1, believe also in me. Verse 10, Jesus questioned, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Verse 11 again, believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else, verse 11, believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, I say to you, verse 12, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Now, remember that Jesus is speaking to the disciples as a group here. There are 11 of them, because at this point, Judas has left the room. And He's speaking to them as a group. Notice the plural of the word hearts, let not your hearts, plural. He's speaking to the group as one together. Judas has left the room. Jesus has told uh, the disciples that one of the group will indeed betray Him, but at this point, it seems they still don't really know that it's Judas. If you look at chapter 13 and verse 29, it suggests quite clearly that even when Judas left the room, even when he walked out, the disciples did not twig or at least make the connection that this meant that he was in fact the betrayer. They assumed that Jesus had simply sent him out on some kind of an, error, uh, an errand. So, for all they knew at this point, 11 left in the room, for all they knew, the betrayer was still in the room. So, imagine yourself sitting in the circle. What are we to do here if even in this circle we can't trust each other? So when someone breaks the trust that others has, have put in him or her, people say, well, if we can't trust him, how can we trust anyone? And that's the problem here. How can there be any trust in this group? That's the problem for the 11 disciples. Now, notice 
how Jesus leads them forward. Jesus does not say, well, now Judas is gone, and he's the bad apple, and so now I want the rest of you all to trust each other. He doesn't say that. Jesus does not say, well, now Judas is gone, and that means that the rest of you are the chosen ones, and so I want all of you to believe in yourselves. He doesn't say that. Jesus, as it were, looks in the face of every person in that circle. There's only one way forward for us here. There's only one way for us to move forward. Every single one of you, Jesus says, must trust in me. And you must do this together. Believe in God, believe also in me. Do you see, this is very important, the answer to broken trust is not to give up trusting. And the answer to broken trust is not to say, well, the only person I can trust is myself, because Peter found out for sure that he couldn't trust himself, and neither can I trust myself, and neither can you trust yourself. The answer to broken trust is that we together trust in Jesus. That's what he teaches us here. And the response, therefore, of wise Christian leaders where trust has been broken is never to say, well, you couldn't trust him, but you can trust us. The response of wise Christian leaders is always to say, here's the position we must always adopt, and we must adopt this together. We must all together trust in Jesus. That's what the church is meant to be. The Christian church can never be a community gathered around the personality or ministry of a leader. The, trust is, the church is a community of people who trust in Jesus. And when others disappoint us, we are to trust in Jesus. And when we disappoint ourselves and let ourselves down, we are to trust in Jesus. It's as if Jesus is saying here in this moment to the 11 who are in the room, now you have discovered that you cannot rely on each other, and you've discovered that you cannot rely on yourselves. Here's what each and every one of you must do, and this is the Christian life. You must believe in me. There is, when trust is broken, a Savior on whom you can rely. And second, there is very wonderfully a promise that you can believe, a promise that you can believe. Look at verse 2, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Now, notice that the place that Jesus has prepared is the Father's house. Jesus does not say, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. I will make this world a better place for you. He does not ever suggest that over the process of centuries that the world will somehow become a place where storms will gradually cease and violence will dissipate and greed will become a thing of the past and that the world will become a marvel. Now, that's not the promise that he makes. Nor does he say that the church will be so pure in this world that there will never be a disappointment, there will never be a setback, there will never be sin to be dealt with. What he does promise is this, your hope is in the Father's house. You see how important that is? The hope of the troubled heart is not that the world will get better. The hope for the troubled heart is not to try and find the perfect church. The hope for the troubled heart lies, lies in the Father's house, and this is the promise that you can believe. 
Now, when Jesus speaks about the Father's house, He is, of course, speaking of heaven, which is clearly beyond our ability to even begin to imagine. And for that very reason, God in Scripture has used a number of different analogies to help us. Let me just mention one or two. In the Bible, heaven is spoken of as a city or even as a country, speaking of its vastness and reminding us of the wonderful truth of how many people will be there, a vast number from every tribe and nation, more than anyone can number, Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. And heaven is spoken of as paradise, um, reminding us that it is a world of joy, that it is filled with pleasure that is at the right hand of God the Father forevermore, a world of delight. And here Jesus describes heaven as home, the Father's house. A.W. Pink says this, Today, the average home, he says, is little more than a boarding house, a place to eat and sleep in. But home used to mean, and still means to some, the place where we are loved for our own sakes, the place where we are always welcome, the place where we can enjoy rest and peace, and the place where our loved ones are together. Isn't that beautiful? That's home. You may say, well, that's a bit of an idealistic picture of home. That's the picture that Jesus is painting when He talks about the Father's house, where you will be loved for your own sake, where you will be always welcome, where you will enjoy perfect peace and rest, and you will be gathered with loved ones all around you. And the Father's house will be better than any home that has ever been on the face of this earth. And you will be more at home in the Father's house. You will feel more at home. You will feel more yourself there than you have felt in any other place in all of your life. When you are in the Father's house, you will say, oh, now this is where I belong. This is what I was made for. This is what I was redeemed for. And Jesus says, in my Father's house are many rooms. When Jesus came to our home, you remember there was no room for Him at the inn? Only a few rooms in Bethlehem, and they were all filled up. No room for Jesus. And it's as if Jesus is saying here, well, now when you come to my home, it's not going to be like when I came to your home. In my Father's house are many rooms. And then Jesus asks this question, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? I love that. Jesus will never mislead you. When He says He is going to prepare a place in the Father's house for you, that means that there is a place prepared in the Father's house for you. And when Jesus says that He's going to prepare a place, I mean, we're not to think of Him up in heaven, sort of working around the clock in order to get heaven ready for the arrival of Christian believers. No, I mean, He spoke the worlds into existence. Uh, Heaven's made ready by a word of His command. That's not what's being described here. What Jesus is saying is that through His going, the place will be prepared. And where is He going? I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's going to the cross. He's going to make atonement for our sins. He's going to die, and He's going to rise, and He's going to ascend to heaven, and it's through His death and through His resurrection and through His ascension to the right hand of the Father that He opens the way for all who believe to enter into the everlasting joy and glory of the Father's house. And aren't you so thankful today that the place is prepared for you, the Father's house is open for you, by Jesus laying down His life for you and not by you laying down your life for Jesus? 
See, isn't that significant? Peter made the promise to Jesus, I will lay down my life for you. And then when it came to the bit, he couldn't do it. He couldn't live up to what he hoped. His Christian life just wasn't at the level that he thought it would be. He promised more than he was able to deliver. If heaven depended on what you were doing for Jesus, your heart would always be troubled, wouldn't it? And so would mine. But thank God, heaven doesn't depend on what you're doing for Jesus, not on your laying down your life for Jesus, but on what Jesus has done for you, His laying down His life for you. That's how heaven is prepared. That is how heaven is opened. There's a Savior you can trust, and there's a promise you can believe, and you can rest on, and you can have peace. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus is the one who's opening heaven, and He's doing it by going to the cross, by laying down His life for you. And then here's the last thing. There is a glorious future that you can anticipate. And what a wonderful truth this is at times when, as believers, we sometimes become discouraged. Verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Notice the words in there, by the way, prepare a place for you. That's the word that Jesus speaks to every believer. That's the word that will be yours if you'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ tonight. He goes to prepare a place for you. And the fact that Jesus went to the cross for you is your guarantee that He will indeed come again and that He will take you to be with Himself, that where He is, you also will be. Jesus went to the cross to prepare a place for you. All that He endured was for this ultimate purpose that you would be with Him in the joy of the Father's house forever and forever, and only when all of His children are safely gathered home in the Father's house will the purpose for which Jesus came into the world and went to the cross actually be fulfilled. And here is why, therefore, you can joyfully anticipate an eternal future in heaven. Jesus went to the cross to prepare the place for you. You can be certain, therefore, that He will come again for you and take you to be with Himself, so that where He is, you may be also. And so He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Do you see where the mind of Jesus settled when His own heart was troubled? Where should you settle your mind when your own heart is troubled, especially by betrayals and denials and, and when everything seems to be going wrong? Where does Jesus settle His mind when, chapter 13 and verse 21, His own spirit is troubled, His own heart is troubled? The answer is that He settles His mind and His heart on the day of victory. Now think about that. How did Jesus get through the betrayal of Judas, the denial of Peter, and all the agony that He suffered on the cross? Jesus got through it, the New Testament tells us, He endured the cross for the joy that was set before Him. He got His mind fixed on the day of ultimate victory, and when faced with these devastating events, that pulled him through. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. 
Now, do you see how practical this is? How then are you going to get through broken trust when that happens in your life? Well, the only way to do it, it, it you, you, you can't get through this if you just fix your eyes on the failures of other people. And you certainly won't get through it if you fix your eyes on your own desire to do better. When our Lord's heart was troubled, He fixed His eye on the day of victory, and He tells us to do the same, I will come again. I will take you to be with myself, that where I am, you may be also. C.H. Spurgeon says this. It was very striking to me. Do not worry yourselves into unbelief. Though this man may have turned traitor and the other may have become a backslider, for the wheels of time are hurrying on to the day of the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ from heaven. I will come again, and I will take you to be with myself. Brothers, sisters, I'm very deeply aware that these are days in which the faith of some is shaken. The trust of some is broken. The hearts of some are wounded. And here is where healing is to be found. Oh, that you would receive this straight out of the Scriptures today. There is a Savior you can trust. So, trust the Savior. As long as you're looking fixed at the failures of others, as long as you're looking fixed at your own resolve to be better than that, your own heart will be troubled. Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, Jesus says. And there is a promise that you can believe. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And He's done it all that is needed to prepare us for heaven and heaven for us has been accomplished through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross. And because the place He has prepared is for you, there is a glorious anticipation, an everlasting life. There is a joy unspeakable that lies ahead of you. So, live with joyful hope because even in the days of the biggest disappointment, ahead of you lies an eternity of life and of joy in the presence of Jesus for all who look to and trust in Him. May that be each and every one of us today and always. Let's pray together. Father, thank You that Your Word speaks again and again to the realities of life as we find it and we ask that You will teach us to fix our eyes upon Jesus, the security of all that He's accomplished for us, and the glorious of hope of all that one day He will bring to us. May this be a weekend of healing in many hearts. May it be a weekend of trusting Jesus in new, more direct, deeper ways. And grant, Father, that knowing Your help, we may bear good witness to Christ until faith is turned to sight and we rejoice in His presence forevermore. And all who agreed said together in Jesus' name, Amen.